Well, good afternoon and welcome to our Coping with COVID webinar series. I'm Dr. Wendy Smeltzer, National Medical Director of Wello, our telemedicine program, and Medical Director for InLiv, our clinic in Calgary. So over the past few months, we've seen the many mental health issues that have arisen through the course of this COVID pandemic, and we've addressed many of them through our webinar series. But one topic that com completely uh, comes up time and time again is our sessions on mental health our concerns about sleep. Insomnia, disturbed sleep patterns, vivid dreams, inability to feel rested, all of these things seem to arise whenever we talk about some of the mental health issues with COVID. So we're really pleased today to have our psychologist, Carolyn Sanders, back with us to dive into this topic and share her knowledge and advice in what we're calling Sleep Boot Camp. Now, if you have any questions that arise, some of you sent them in ahead of time, but any questions that do arise through the presentation, feel free to use the chat button and uh, ask those questions and we'll make time at the end for some of them. So I'm gonna give you a bit of an intro on Caroline. She's a registered psychologist with over 20 years of counseling experience in the Calgary area. She's worked in social services, community mental health services, and primary care with individuals, youths, couples, and families. She has a special interest though in sleep and sleep disorders and she loves teaching people how to sleep, as well as a way to improve their mental health and improve their vitality through sleep. Over the past five years, Carolyn has taught physicians, nurses, and many other healthcare professionals how to use cognitive behavior therapy for insomnia strategies. And these are very effective with patients in helping manage insomnia and treatments. Carolyn also teaches people how to manage stress, deal with burnout, overcome anxiety, and just live with purpose and meaning and doing more of what matters, all of things relevant for these times. So we really appreciate you joining us again today, Caroline, and we'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Wendy. I'm really excited to be coming back and talking again about one of my favorite topics, which is sleep. And um, if we can just have a look at the agenda here. Um, this is sort of a part two. I did a part one talk in May, a webinar that was talking about the primary drivers for insomnia. And today is sort of a continuation and deepening of that um, topic. So my recommendation to you is that uh, you, you watch that first webinar, which will be sent out again um, to people that registered for this one today if you didn't get a chance to see it. We will review some of the reasons why insomnia develops here in this presentation, but we won't be going into as much detail. Today, what we're really going to be working on is a very focused step-by-step -step process for people who have struggled with chronic insomnia. So I'm going to walk you through how you use a sleep diary to assess and understand your sleep needs. I'm gonna to talk to you about the step-by-step -step process to create an individualized sleep prescription. And along the way, we're gonna talk about correcting behaviors that create insomnia, but a little bit less focused there than we did the next time. So the first thing that I wanna give is my disclaimer. Actually, I see that some of my disclaimer is missing. <laughs> so in the center of my slide is missing. So I'm gonna tell you what that disclaimer is, that if you are a shift worker, if you have pain or medical conditions that impact your sleep, if you have obstructive sleep apnea or use a CPAP, uh, if you have other sleep disorders such as sleep walking or sleep aggression, or if you have long-term use of sleep medications, it's a really good idea to consult with your family physician. You may need a referral to a sleep clinic or a sleep specialist. And usually before we start a behavioral plan to manage sleep problems, we wanna make sure that other underlying conditions are well treated as best as they could. Um, and people that are shift workers um, have sort of a special protocol that would need, be, need to be applied that we won't be able to get into today. So that's my disclaimer. And now I'm gonna talk about what the criteria, the diagnosis for insomnia is, how we diagnose insomnia. So these are the criteria. Basically concerns with quality or quantity of sleep, which could include trouble falling asleep, staying asleep, or waking up early and being unable to get back to sleep. Um, another hallmark is that it causes significant distress or impairment of functioning. That means that insomnia is a 24 hour problem that affects people in their work and personal life during the day. Um, difficulty sleeping that occurs at least three times a week and is happening for at least three months would be the criteria for insomnia and chronic would be six months. So you can see that there's actually quite a bit of variability in that description. So having 
you know, periodic bad nights are not necessarily indicative of insomnia, especially if we can learn to take them in stride and contain them in such a way as to not create a vicious cycle of sleep problems. Um, in insomnia, the problem occurs despite ample opportunity to sleep. So that means that if we take our person that's struggling with insomnia, who's very fatigued, and we give them the opportunity to nap, they, they usually cannot nap. They would say, I had a nap once in 1987. Like it, they just, they, they would like to will themselves to nap, but they are unable. And very important that the difficulty around sleep cannot be explained by other physical, uh, mental, or sleep-wake disorders or to substance use or medication. So we really want to rule out any other causes for the sleep problem, and that's the part where your family doctor may play a very important role. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about what is CBTI. I just need to advance my slide here. Uh, so CBTI basically stands for Cognitive Behavior Therapy for Insomnia, and that is a treatment that helps people learn to fall asleep and stay asleep, generally without but sometimes alongside medications. CBTI improves sleep quality by changing sleep habits and creating, creating more adaptive thinking about sleep. So you'll notice that I didn't say sleep quantity because the goal is not to turn everyone into an eight hour sleeper. Instead, the goal is to create refreshing, consolidated natural sleep. So that's really what we're aiming for in CBTI. And what I want you to know is that it's as effective as medication for treating insomnia. It's a very um, robust and well-studied protocol, and it's called evidence-based. And what that means is that there is a, a raft of research that shows us that the strategies that I'm going to be talking to you about this afternoon work very well. And they're considered a first-line treatment for patients that present to family doctors for sleep problem. However, in most cases, family doctors either don't have training or they don't have someone within their clinics that can do CBTI um, for their patients. So that's why it's not offered as frequently as it could be. Okay. So what's happening here? So now we're going to talk about the goals of insomnia treatment. And um, uh, one of the goals, the hallmarks of good insomnia treatment is that it creates sleep efficiency. So what we mean by that is that about 85 to 90% of the time that you're in bed, you're asleep. It means that you don't usually spend more than 30 minutes, give or take, awake in bed. So around 30 minutes awake in bed is considered normal and not insomnia. So that's important to, to keep in mind. But generally, we're trying to limit the amount of time awake in bed. And that another goal of treatment is that you, you feel generally refreshed and energized in the day, but not necessarily first thing in the morning. So if you're expecting to wake up and bounce out of bed energized, that's actually not realistic for a lot of people. And it would be perfectly normal to have grogginess in the morning and to take a little while to kind of get in gear. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later on uh, here this afternoon. Another goal is that your anxiety about bedtime and sleeping is reduced. And the last one, which I think is, is really important, is that your sleep confidence returns. And what I mean by that is lots of the patients that I see would fear that they have lost their natural ability to sleep or that they've somehow messed up their sleep system. And so um, hopefully I'm going to teach you some strategies today that are going to allow you to increase the confidence that um, you can be in tune with your body, that you have a good understanding of what your body needs. And we're going to do that by collecting data and that you can learn to uh, meet your body's needs in a way that that's going to fit. And that by doing that, you feel more confident that uh, you're going to be able to manage any sleep problems that come up and that you have um, brought back your natural ability to rest. And of course, we're looking for quality sleep. That means um, consolidated deep sleep, not necessarily quantity, since that differs from person to person. So this is a bit of a review slide from uh, my presentation in May about why insomnia develops. So I'll just remind you that understanding your unique drivers um, kind of your unique behaviors that you use to manage fatigue are a really important part of setting uh, what's going to be a unique sleep prescription for you. And so what's happening in insomnia is that a person may have a bad night 
or they may have a chronic condition such as depression or chronic pain that generates fatigue, low energy, and a feeling of being lethargic. And how we generally cope with those symptoms is often by reducing activities and spending more time in bed. That just makes sense, right? So if you're feeling very tired, you may either stay in bed later or um, do less activity during the day, or you may go to bed earlier. And those are some of the examples of behaviors that negatively impact the sleep system. By sleep system, I mean the body clock and the sleep driver system, the, the, the part of our body that generates deep sleep drive. So once those are interrupted, then insomnia develops. And of course, insomnia is a problem of fatigue. So then we have a vicious cycle going. And our goal of insomnia treatment is to break this vicious cycle by changing the behaviors that people engage in to manage fatigue. So let's have a look now at a reminder um, from our May webinar, which is the three primary causes of insomnia, which is that maybe there's something in our life such as a stressor that creates a short-term sleep disruption, and we do something to compensate with the fatigue, maybe like drink coffee or nap or not go to our exercise class or not walk the dog. And depending on what those behaviors are, one of three things could happen or perhaps a combination of all three. So maybe we mess with our body clock or our circadian system. So things that would mess with our body clock are things like napping, going to bed too early, waking up too late, or we mess with our sleep driver system. So the part, the chemical cascade in our body that is generating and producing deep sleep, we mess with it because we are so inactive that our body doesn't produce enough sleep. Or lastly, we've habitually paired being in bed with being awake. So we lay in bed awake, exerting a lot of effort to try to force our body to sleep. And so those are three of the things um, that are going to cause insomnia. Now, I said this in May and I'm going to say it again. If you manage the first two problems, you don't have to worry about the third. So if you do a really good job on the first two, and we're going to talk about that in detail today, you don't have to worry too much about the third. You don't have to worry about trying to relax for sleep. Your body will take care of you. So that's um, um, just, I guess, a reminder about the problem that's happening during COVID is that our rhythms and routines have been really severely disrupted, and this has a big impact on our body. But I want you to know that it can be corrected, and it takes effort for sure, but it can improve quite dramatically in as little as one to two weeks. So one to two weeks of really solid discipline and following the rules, which I'm gonna to talk to you about today, can make a dramatic difference. And by about week four, you will find that for a lot of people, their sleep system is completely healed and, and they're feeling significantly better. So let's talk a little bit about what this four week plan looks like. And I like to call it sleep boot camp because I think that if you are very fluffy about how you approach uh, these strategies and techniques, you are going to get fluffy results. So, so the idea here is to get serious and take a very committed and disciplined approach really over a matter of just a few weeks and then assess what kind of difference that makes for your body. So the first thing that you're going to do is you're going to assess your sleep for two weeks and I'm going to teach you how to do that. Then using the data that you've collected, you're going to then set a sleep prescription and I'll teach you how to do that this afternoon, how to set your sleep prescription that is unique to you. Then you're gonna apply that sleep prescription for about four weeks very consistently. Really the most change is gonna happen in the first two weeks. The last two weeks are more like fine tuning. And at the end of that four weeks, you're gonna reassess how the experiment has gone and you're gonna to recommit to what works for you in your life as part of a long-term plan. So now we're gonna talk about how you assess your sleep. So you must, must, this is a rule, you must, collect data on your sleep. You cannot rely on your subjective sort of memory because if I asked you last Tuesday night, what time did you fall asleep? How many times did you wake up for how long? How late did you sleep in in the morning? You won't remember the details of that. And we really need to collect all of those little bits of data so that we can learn how much sleep your body produces. This is sort of the key stone of insomnia treatment is understanding how much sleep your body produces so that you can create a plan based on that. So you have to collect data. 
you may say to me, why can't I just use my Fitbit or why can't I use my Apple Watch? Why do I have to use this like old school <laughs> paper and pencil thing? So the problem with um, Fitbits, Apple Watches, is that there is a degree of error built in. They are also built on what's called an accelerometer, which means that it is measuring your movement and your heart rate. And that's always not an indicator of um, how much, whether you're actually sleeping, since we'd sort of have to look at a person's brain. But even then, that data doesn't tell you a key part of what we're collecting in a sleep diary, which is how you rate the quality of your sleep. In other words, how rested that you feel. So um, I, would, I wouldn't uh, recommend using um, the, the Fitbit or the Apple Watch just because of the, the error that's, that's built in. Also, sometimes people look at that data and it can make them quite anxious when they realize that they're awake many times in the night and actually waking in the night is normal. So, um, so I would recommend against it. Um, there are some apps uh, that you can use, such as CBTI Coach, which is a good one that was built by a Canadian. It's free, and we're going to give you the, the information for that at the end of our, end of our webinar here. We really want to have um, pure data on uh, how much sleep our body is producing, not our subjective impression. Um, you may say, well, I think I sleep about four or five hours a night, but we really want to look at night by night how much sleep your body is producing. The other problem is that our memory of sleep is very influenced by factors such as our mood. So, so I'm, I've left you with the sleep diary at the end of our webinar here that you can print off and use, and this is what it looks like, and we're going to talk a little bit more about how to use it in detail here. So... On my next slide, if I can get it to advance, there we go. We have how to record your sleep data. And um, so how I want you to use the sleep diary is that it does not have to be perfect. You don't have to be a clock watcher. You don't have to say I was up from 3.21 a.m. to 3.52 a.m. Instead, you can say, you know, I, was, I think I was awake for 20 minutes the first time, a half an hour the second time. So it doesn't have to be perfect. We're looking for patterns and we're gonna take an overall average. So if you miss a few bits of data here and there, I don't want you to be concerned about that. It's really important that you don't re uh, record the rating of the quality of your sleep until you've been up for a bit, you know, for sure one hour um, and maybe even as much as two due to what we call sleep drunkenness. So that is a real thing. And this is um, also called sleep inertia. And what it means is that when you wake up in the morning, no matter how much sleep you've had, you may, um, you may feel very, very groggy, and it may take you a while for the gears to get moving. And this is about our circadian rhythm, kind of getting stimulated and catching up. This is especially prominent for people that are night owls. So night owls, no matter how much sleep they get, may have a difficult time waking. So don't rate your quality of sleep right away as when your eyes pop open. Wait a little bit longer before you, you uh, use that one to five rating at the bottom of the sleep diary. You're going to want to keep a note about other factors that you think might, that might be influencing your sleep, such as alcohol, naps, or interruptions in the night. If you're taking a sleep medication, I want you to take it as directed during the period of the boot camp. And what I mean by that is um, as your doctor instructed you to take it, and I want you to avoid topping it up in the middle of the night. So sometimes when people wake in the middle of the night, they will top it up, and I want you to just take it as directed so we can get a better read on what's happening in terms of the nighttime waking. And I want you to keep track for two weeks. So here's an example of a sleep diary completed. This is the example of Bob. So if we look at Bob's sleep diary, we can see that he went to bed anytime between 10, 15 and midnight, depending on the night. And after settling down, so he got into bed, but it took him anywhere from 20 minutes to two hours to fall asleep. And he woke up in the night between one and three times for, let's see, half an hour to 90 minutes, if we added up the number of times that he woke up. And he woke up between 6 and 9.30, depending on the day, and he got up between 7 and 9.45. So that means that you wake, you may see what time it is, but you lay in bed for a little bit longer. So we can see that Bob's laying in bed for a little longer. And so then he calculated how long did you spend in bed last night total? So that range, his total time in bed ranged from eight hours to sort of nine and a half hours. And under that, you see the row of the quality of how he rated his sleep. 
and he made a couple notes about drinks. So um, what we're trying to glean from this sleep diary is how much sleep your body produced. So um, we can see that on Monday that Bob, um, if we were to figure out how much sleep he produced, he went to bed at 10.15. It took him 45 minutes to fall asleep, give or take. So he fell asleep at about 11. He woke up at about 6.30. So he was in bed at that point for about seven and a half hours, but we have to subtract the amount of time that he spent awake in the middle of the night, which was about 90 minutes. So we would say that he produced, you know, approximately six hours of sleep. And we can also see, we'll actually just go to our next one here and I'll show you a little bit about sleep efficiency. So once we've got um, that calculation, we, now we can do math. Now don't freak out, I think it's about grade six math. <laughs> but if doing the math makes you nervous, you can go online, you can use the app CBTI Coach, or you can go online to the My Sleep Well uh, which we're going to give you the, the uh, link to at the end of this presentation and it allow it, it will let you calculate your sleep efficiency without having to do math. So you can see my little chicken scratchings here. These are this is my math. And um, so then what I did is I, I completed that calculation of how much sleep did Bob produce each night every night by adding up his little chunks of sleep. So you can see the numerator, the top number shows how much sleep he produced six hours, six hours, 6.25, five and so on. Then the bottom number, the denominator, is his total amount of time in bed. So nine and a quarter hours, eight hours, and underneath I've calculated uh, the percentage of sleep efficiency. You remember that's the number that we're trying to influence with this, this technique. I probably made some sort of math um, um, mistake there because I'm a psychologist, not a mathematician, but that's okay. If you make a mistake, it's no problem because again, you're gonna have two weeks of data and we're using averages and we're looking for patterns, so it does not have to be perfect. And um, if you don't like the math, you can use an online resource. So now we have some information about uh, sleep efficiency, which we can see is between 53 and 85%. That's about typical for someone with insomnia, but we really want it more like 85 or 90%. So then my next question to my patients that bring me a sleep diary that looks like this is why spend nine hours in bed if your body produces six or seven hours of sleep. So we know that the body through a, a chemical cascade is going to produce a certain amount of sleep, but people will tend to spend more time in bed because they think they will get more sleep. But you'll remember from our first presentation that sleep drive is built through adenosine, that chemical cascade in the body. And your body's gonna produce a certain amount, but we can't force it to make more. And we can see that if we look at the sleep uh, foundation recommendations that for an adult, the range of what would be um, acceptable in terms of sleep is actually pretty wide. It's between six and 10 hours. A lot of my insomnia patients um, are people that do tend to produce more like between six and a half and seven and a half hours of sleep, but they think that they should be producing eight or they think they should be in bed for at least eight hours. And so then they start to spend a little bit too much time in bed and that causes their sleep drive to dilute over too many hours and we get broken sleep. So um, then I would ask you to think about what feels better to you, eight hours of broken sleep or six and a half hours of consolidated sleep. So ideally six and a half hours, most people will say is what feels better. Um, of course, you may be saying to me right now, Caroline, I'd like to get consolidated sleep, but I keep waking up. <laughs> and so the method that we're, I'm going to teach you about now is how we sort of uh, reset or reprogram the brain to get consolidated sleep by retraining your behaviors. So in our top little chart here, we see a good, you know, good sleeper, still with some bad nights, awake in bed for a little while, maybe half an hour reading a book or what have you then I'm going to sleep and then it is the blue and in the green bars we see that they wake and so you'll remember that waking about every 90 minutes would be normal part of the sleep cycle so going through stage one two three REM wake brief wakening falling back asleep is normal so our good sleeper wakes several times a night but those those wakings are brief and they probably don't remember then wakes up and gets up for the day but a person with insomnia goes to bed much earlier because they are very fatigued, but can't fall asleep until later. 
has middle waking that is larger, right, taking up more time, feels very fatigued in the morning and stays in bed longer. So let's look now at um, what the correction starts to look like. So on top we have our person with insomnia and while they're working on it, which is the method that I'm going to teach you, they're going to start to go to bed potentially much later than they normally would and allow sleep drive to build up. They may, while they're working on it, continue to have middle waking in the night because the brain has developed a bit of a habit. But if they persist in the sleep prescription that they set for themselves and get their feet on the floor and try to help their body clock reset, that usually within days to weeks, they will be improved and having more consolidated sleep again. This procedure is called sleep restriction. Okay, do not freak out. <laughs> sleep restriction does not mean restricting your sleep. I know your sleep is already restricted, it's terrible. Sleep restriction means that we're gonna try to um, match the amount of time in bed to be about equal to the amount of sleep that your body produces, plus about 30 minutes because 30 minutes being in bed awake is just fine. So now you have your sleep diary and let's think back to Bob. And now I want us to think back to the example of Bob, how much time should Bob spend in bed? Well, if you remember from his sleep diary, when I did my math, which could have been sketchy, he produced just over six hours of sleep. So it was like, you know, six hours and 10 minutes or something. We don't have to be perfect about that. So I thought I'd just round it up to six and a quarter. And we're gonna add 30 minutes because being in bed for 30 minutes awake is fine. And so we would say that Bob should spend about six hours and 45 minutes in bed total. So that's sort of his, his sleep window. Um, but when should Bob go to bed? So I would encourage Bob to go to bed when he is sleepy. I know this sounds kind of funny because that makes sense, but most of us are, are thinking about what time it is, what time the clock says, and what time we have to get up tomorrow when we make a decision about going to bed. But I would like you to think about going to bed when you have signs of sleepiness. Remembering that people who struggle with insomnia have problems with daytime fatigue. And fatigue and sleepiness are two different things. Fatigue is very common in, problem with, in people with sleep problems. It means that you feel tired, sluggish, like unmotivated, cloudy, heavy, grouchy. But if given the opportunity to sleep, a person who is fatigued will not necessarily fall asleep. Most of the time they will not. Um, a person that is sleepy is struggling to stay awake. They are doing the head bob. They cannot keep their eyes open. And um, so I want you to watch for signs of sleepiness to determine when to, when to go to sleep. A problem of daytime sleepiness is sleep apnea. So sleep apnea means that you're falling asleep even when you're not supposed to. And if that's happening to you, although apnea and insomnia can co-occur, it's really important that you, you treat the apnea before you engage in a program like this. So if you're watching this and you're saying, well, I fall asleep three times a day while I'm in the living room when the news comes on or if I'm waiting for something, then I would want you to see your doctor and have a sleep apnea check. So let's think again about how we wanna use the sleep window to figure out what time Bob should wake up. So we know that we would like Bob to watch for signs of sleepiness, but I also wanna see if Bob is able to accommodate um, his early bird or his night owl, and maybe that's something that you would be able to do as well. If you're able to, depending on your schedule, I want you to try to get up earlier if you're a morning person and sleep in later if you're a night person. So to move that sleep window back and forth to try to accommodate your early bird or your night owl. Obviously, um, sometimes that's not possible due to work, but if it is possible, see if you can do it. Um, look at your sleep diary and notice when you naturally wake up. That's different than when you get out of bed, but when you naturally wake up, you may be laying there for a few minutes, but if you tend to naturally wake at the same time, that would probably be the time that you want to get up. Um, or you may have to count the number of hours back from when you have to be up for work. So for example, if Bob had to be at work at eight and he gets up at let's say 7 a.m., then we would want to count back his six hours and 45 minutes from 7 a.m. So that would take us back to 12.15 would be Bob's earliest bedtime. We call that his earliest bedtime, 
meaning that if he feels sleepy and he's ready for sleep and he's doing the head bob and his eyes are closed, closing, then it's time for bed. But if he's still a little bit awake and he's not quite ready, he's not sleepy, he may be a little fatigued but not sleepy, it would be okay to stay up later. However, regardless of the bedtime, Bob and you have to get your feet on the floor at the time that you have prescribed once you've figured out your sleep diary. It's really, really important that you're gonna keep that prescribed wake time seven days a week during sleep boot camp. You may be saying like, why, why am I doing this? This woman, this woman is trying to torture me. But I would say to you, you have already been sleep deprived for many months and in, in cases for many, many years. And this sort of reprogramming process is gonna take you two to four weeks of working really, really hard. And then it's gonna to start to get a lot better. So um, I would often make the analogy, I can just advance my slide here. I would make the analogy of sleep training a baby. So many people that are on our webinar this afternoon may have babies or toddlers at home, and they may remember what it is like to try to get their baby to sleep through the night when they've decided that a nighttime breastfeed or bottle feed is no longer necessary. And so that as you try to wean that feed and you try strategies to help settling your baby at night, the baby cries and you may decide we're not giving that bottle at two o'clock in the morning no matter what happens we're going to help our baby get through the morning but during that time the baby cries so in this analogy you are the baby you may cry for a few days because uh, you're getting up at this early time and you've had a rough night but if you deviate from the plan and you say oh that's it i'm going to bed earlier tonight oh that's it i'm laying on the couch today what will happen is that your boot camp will be much, much longer than four weeks. Uh, it will take longer to reset your circadian rhythm. So I would really encourage you to stick with the plan. So here is your new sleep uh, prescription now. Once you've got your sleep window set and you've determined your wake time and your earliest bedtime, I want you to keep doing your sleep diary so that you can see the progress that you're making in terms of your sleep becoming more consolidated. Like I said, if you're a middle waker, you can expect that you'll probably continue to wake in the middle of the night for at least a few more nights while your, your brain is kind of you know, getting, the, getting with the program. Um, if you are waking in the middle of the night, give yourself a few you know, minutes to see if you're gonna fall back asleep. 15-ish, but again, you don't have to watch the clock. It's more that, that feeling that you've become very alert and you just feel like wide awake. And if you feel wide awake, I'd want you to get up and, and go and do another activity. And we're gonna talk about some examples of some of those activities in just a minute. But remember, even if you wake up in the night, you still need to be up at the same time the next day. And it's really important that you get your feet on the floor within you know, a few minutes, 10 minutes or so of your prescribed wake time. You don't wanna linger in bed, sort of hitting the snooze because it will mess up your sleep drive for the following night. So now let's talk about what to do if you're up in the middle of the night. Um, actually, one of the, uh, a question came in prior to our webinar, so thank you for that question. Firstly, I think it's really important to talk to your partner about your plan so they know what's going on, that they don't need to worry about you in the middle of the night, that you're working on your sleep. It's going to take you a few weeks, and you may be up roaming around the house um, so that they know. And part of being up in the night is about sort of reframing to ourselves that for right now, this is all the sleep my body has produced. And I want to try and say to myself, you know, I'm awake, but this is a quiet and peaceful time. There's nobody else awake. And I'm working on trying to teach my body to learn to be asleep at night. And that's a process. So that means I just need to, you know, occupy my time in the middle of the night, just do something pleasant. Um, you can basically do whatever you like because remember your body has produced as much sleep as it's going to potentially so this is not about forcing yourself to sleep or trying to generate sleep I've had you know patients that have a hot bath in the middle of the night or you know you don't need to do that it's not about that it's you know engage in a hobby watch Netflix uh, do a crossword I had a, a client of mine that would get up and dust her um, glassware in the middle of the night because she hated doing it but I want you to avoid any kind of screen that is backlit so that means no tablets no phones and no computer screens because they emit blue light that interferes with melatonin which will interfere with your sleep 
So as much as we don't want to force sleep, it's also not about um, getting in our body's way. So do things that are non-technological. If there's a lot of thoughts in your mind, you can write them down. Keep a note if, if there's things that are bothering you. I'd write them down and get them out of your head. Uh, watch for signs of sleepiness. If you become sleepy and you're doing the head bob on the couch, don't fall asleep on the couch because we don't want to associate the couch with sleep. Go back to bed. But it's really important that you get up uh, at your prescribed wake time, even if you've had a really rough night. Okay, so beware um, the, the kinds of things that could interfere with your sleep drive after you've had a bad night. So I don't want you hitting the snooze or missing your regular meal times or drinking more than like one fluid ounce <laughs> cup of coffee in the morning, not skipping your regular exercise routine or walking the dog or laying on the couch all day or napping because those are gonna interfere with your sleep drive for the following night. So once you've done that for, for two weeks, you should be a lot better and you've kept track using your sleep diary. Then I want you to fine tune your sleep prescription. So watch your sleep efficiency as you're calculating it improve over the week or two. And once you're at 85 to 90% of sleep efficiency, about 85 or 90% of the time you're in bed, you're asleep, you can reassess. Have a look at your sleep quality on that one to five scale. If you're, if you're still feeling like you're not as well rested as you could be, you can now begin to experiment with adding 15 minutes to your time in bed. You can either go to bed 15 minutes earlier, especially if you're a morning person and you're, you're getting really tired and it's hard to stay up, or you can sleep in 15 minutes longer. And then you just reassess that, keep track and reassess every couple of days how you're feeling, your sleep quality. But if your sleep starts to break, by that I mean you're starting to have middle waking again, then you've probably gone too far and you need to tighten it back up. I just wanna remind you about, um, or, or touch on one thing about the sleep um, prescription. There should be no reason why you need to reduce your sleep prescription below six hours. Um, it would be very rare, even for insomniacs, to get a total amount of sleep if we add up all the little bits that's less than six hours, and we just find that you, there's no need to reduce it below six hours. So six hours should be your absolute minimum. And then if you find you're falling asleep very, very quickly, like within a couple of minutes, you're sleeping all night, and you're waking up and you're still a little bit tired, you may start to increase that in 15 minute increments. So now you might be asking me, but why can't I sleep in? <laughs> can't I sleep in? Well, you could if you wanted to mess with your, all of your work. Um, only if you want to have jet lag. And by that, I mean, if you sleep in for an hour or two on Saturday morning, you can expect that you've shifted your whole circadian rhythm by an hour or two, which is just like flying to Toronto on Friday or Saturday night and back to Calgary on Sunday night. And that creates Sunday night insomnia. Um, so, so sleeping in is not part of sleep boot camp, but it might be after you feel like your sleep is uh, settled again. It might be an occasional sleep in might be okay, but not during the boot camp. And of course, you might be saying to me, life happens. How am I supposed to have this prescribed sleep schedule my whole life? Well, I would say, just try it for four weeks of sleep boot camp and revel in your newfound energy and, and notice how good you feel. And then say, okay, reassess. Which of these habits can I keep? Now, what have I learned about myself and my sleep? What do I need to do to keep myself back on, get myself back on track when I've been disrupted? So of course, life happens and we have to build in flexibility. Just a quick reminder about sleep and substances. This was a slide from our previous presentation. Um, alcohol is going to induce sleep faster, but you'll see from our blue line of our person that had a few drinks before bed, what happens is they have a lot more waking in the second half of the night. So if middle waking is a problem for you, you absolutely should not be consuming alcohol if you want to correct your insomnia because alcohol is going to increase the amount of middle waking that you're having, especially in the second half of the night. And of course, the next day, it's really going to affect how you feel and your behaviors, which could start that vicious cycle again. I'll say something here too about dealing with worries about sleep. And that is that people often have a lot of worries about not getting enough sleep, and that's why they exert so much extra effort. 
people that sleep well, and we say good sleepers because they still have lots of bad nights, they think about their sleep differently than people with insomnia. How you think about your sleep really impacts what's happening in your body. Um, frustration and worry, especially in the middle of the night, create a lot of arousal in the body. And so then that's sort of counterproductive to falling back in, uh, asleep. Um, learning to be flexible in your thinking and being able to say, I'm helping my body learn some new habits. This is going to take time. And that also means periods of being awake can help you. I've attached a um, worksheet at the end of our webinar here with um, just some samples of how you can be more flexible in your thinking when you're working through your insomnia treatment. And I hope that will be a good, a good resource to you. Um, especially around signs of tiredness. So experiencing tiredness during the day when you're working through this program is a very good sign that your body's natural sleep drive is coming back. But we don't wanna to go to bed early, right? Because we wanna have that consolidated sleep. Lastly, I'll just make a comment about medications. So if you are a person that's taking sleep medications, it's really important that you do not stop them uh, abruptly because that can create some withdrawal. I want you to keep your medications stable and as prescribed by your physician during boot camp uh, because your sleep is going to improve regardless of whether you take the medication or not. And after uh, four weeks, when your sleep efficiency is better, you could reassess at that point. You may be in a place where you want to revisit your sleep medications and how you use them. And that would be a really good time to talk to your doctor. You could also um, read more about how sleep medications and how to taper them safely at mysleepwell.ca, which is one of my favorite sleep websites. Lastly, um, here is your summary of insomnia instructions. This has also been included as a worksheet that'll be sent out at the end of our webinar this afternoon that summarizes all of the recommendations that we talked about today, plus some of the ones from the first presentation, and that's available to you as well. And you can make a note to yourself about your earliest bedtime and your wake time and keep that up um, while you're working on your sleep. So I hope that was, whew, oh my gosh, I feel like I got a workout trying to get through all of, that, all of that information in such a short time. I hope that was helpful. And now I wanna cover some questions. So we're gonna have, uh, Wendy, come back and uh, tell me what kinds of questions have come in during this rapid Absolutely. fire talk. <laughs> Absolutely. We've got a number of uh, questions that have come in for you, Caroline. So we'll get through as many as we can. Um, one is that uh, I think you've probably answered some of these throughout, but I'm going to get this one specifically. How do I keep my teenager on track for mm -hmm. proper bedtimes and not sleeping the day away through the summer? Oh man. So teenagers are like a whole nother thing. We'd almost have to have a whole separate webinar. Although lots of the strategies that we've talked about are applicable to teenagers, we don't use sleep restrictions with teenagers. And so I will uh, recommend a book by Dr. Colleen Carney that just came out about teens. I've actually been working through it myself. This is it right here. <laughs> it actually just came out at the beginning of June and it's called Good Night Mind for Teens written by Colleen Carney, who's a Canadian sleep specialist, and she talks specifically about teenage sleep and how to apply these strategies to teens. Excellent. Excellent. Um, what would you say would be your top number one tip, your number one thing, if there's one thing you could do that would yeah. set yourself up for a good night's sleep? I feel like the number one thing is that would correct every problem is if you had a bad night the next day, to do your regular routine, to not go to bed earlier, to do nothing different and kind of push through the day. Uh, and that would, then you would never fall into the vicious cycle at all. Interesting. It's what very are... difficult to consolidate everything into one tip. <laughs> <laughs> I think you managed to get a few in there, but that's okay. What um, are some bedtime routines that you think would help with sleep? foods to avoid that might affect your sleep, um, um, just some vitamin recommendations and, and a routine that might, a bedtime routine. Is there something you recommend, Caroline? Yeah, I mean, if we just remember that sleep is natural and our bodies want to sleep, um, so producing sleep is what our bodies are designed to do. And so we, you know, in the, in the last hour or two before bed, 
we want to just get our bodies ready for that just as we do with our kids when they're little. And so, you know, getting away from stimulating things and starting to slow the body and mind down with like reading or TV and having the same ritual every time is teaching our brain to get ready for bad. Excellent. Um, what about vitamins, Caroline? Somebody is asking specifically about B and D vitamins to improve sleep. Have you, yeah. do you have any recommendations there? You know, if you have, you know, I, that's something I would usually defer to speak with a doctor if someone has a specific deficiency. I'm not aware of any specific vitamins. There's some evidence for some things, but I'm not, there's not robust evidence that would be more powerful than using CBTI. So I usually don't recommend using supplements. Uh, and would that include things like melatonin? So melatonin is a little bit different. Um, we talked about it a lot in our first, a little, well, not a lot, but a little bit more in the webinar that we did in May. So we know that melatonin is a naturally occurring substance in the body and it can help people when their insomnia is caused by problems with the body clock. So for example, it's indicated in jet lag. So if you travel across time zones and your body clock is really messed up, melatonin can help you advance the body clock. But the vast majority of people with insomnia have a combination of those three causes. And so melatonin usually doesn't do that much for people with chronic insomnia. Now, would that apply as well? You were talking about somebody who maybe had a little bit of a different pattern on a weekend, slept in a little bit. Would it help them to take melatonin when they're getting back to their routine? Oh, that's a good question. So melatonin is um, indicated for use in, in shift workers. But so that would be an example of a situation, right, where that shift is constantly changing. But ideally, I would recommend seeing a sleep specialist about that if you're somebody who's a shift worker who has a lot of problems with circadian rhythm, because melatonin is often taken incorrectly at the wrong dosage and at the wrong time. Because we see it at the, at the drugstore, so we think we can just pick it up and take it. But I would want you to see a sleep specialist and not to use it as part of like a, I think I'll try it on Sunday night to deal with my insomnia. Mm -hmm. What I would say to you is, if you aren't sleepy on Sunday night because you stayed up, it's no problem. Just stay up later. Don't go to bed at 10 o'clock. Go to bed at 12 or one o'clock in the morning and get up for work at seven it's fine, your brain will catch up and you'll be right back on track. It sounds like routine is one of the most important things that I'm hearing yeah, come out from sure. you. Stay with that routine. Yeah, for um, sure. There's a question here about somebody who says, I've started falling asleep with bot podcasts, Netflix, etc., but tend to wake up when the talking stops. How detrimental is that and any tips on breaking that? Yeah, people are commonly using podcasts or Netflix um, to give their mind something to focus on so that they don't have racing thoughts. The problem is that when the sound changes, it can, you know, it can cause us to wake. And then we feel like we need that podcast and the Netflix again at 2 a.m. or 4 a.m. to get ourselves back to sleep. So I'm not here to say it's detrimental, but I would say, can you just wait for signs of sleepiness in your body? You know, if you wait for signs of sleepiness, you don't have to try to rest your racing mind. You'll remember from the first webinar, we talked about very strong sleep drive. In other words, being very sleepy inhibits thinking. You get so tired, you can't think. <laughs> it's just a lot easier to let your body get sleepy than try to force your body to sleep. So that's why, I mean, if you can avoid the, the sort of Netflix and podcasts, it can be okay as part of your pre-sleep wind down routine. You just want to do that outside of the bedroom. Okay, perfect. Also a question about, I know you talked about staying away from screen time because of that blue light emission, mm -hmm. but uh, then again, to get involved in some activities, you know, that might um, keep you occupied if you do have nighttime awakening. So there is a question about, what about video games if they're not on a computer screen? But, what uh, video I, game is not on a computer screen? It must be through a television. I think you can... I'm, I'm yeah. not sure, so, but just saying that, that they're TVs, saying watching Netflix, so wondering about something more interactive like a video game if it's not okay. on a computer. Right. So TVs are also backlit, but we don't put our faces right up to mm -hmm. them. <laughs> so, so it's not like a screen or tablet. So then the next question yeah. will be, well, could I play video games in the middle of the night? 
I mean, if you really wanted to, I guess, knowing that if you, if you get really absorbed in the video game and you miss signs of natural sleepiness, you could end up being up until your wake time. That would be okay. You'd just be really tired mm -hmm. the next day. And then you'd need to stay up the whole next day until your earliest bedtime. So, I mean, it's not the end of the world. Um, but if your goal is to try to, to watch for signs of sleepiness and take your body back to bed when you're sleepy, um, then you might want to avoid video games. I think it depends what your goal is. Mm -hmm. Um, a couple of questions regarding um, different reasons for waking at night. One is hot flashes. Oh, yeah. um, oh. And uh, so any advice you can give on that, Caroline, if you're waking oh up God. a few times in the night for that reason? This menopause issue came up before. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> It's really hard to deal with, actually. And um, middle waking will commonly be increased during perimenopause and menopause when women are struggling with hot flashes. Um, obviously, one of the things that's happening when you have a lot of hot flashes is the bed starts to become associated with being awake because you have expectancy. It's like, I know I'm going to wake up. I'm going to be boiling hot. I just hate it. And so now we're getting frustrated and the frustration causes arousal. Mm -hmm. So I would continue to follow. So CBTI has been used with women who are perimenopausal and menopausal. I would continue to use these same strategies. Obviously, you do what you can to have a cool room. You talk to your doctor if you think you need um, extra help or support around this, mm -hmm. and you continue to follow the same strategies, which is if you wake and you're too hot, to say, okay, I'm gonna be up for a bit. Sometimes setting up a cozy spot in another room with your activities and, and space where you say, this is my nighttime place where I go when I'm awake. It's got my stuff. I don't fall asleep there, but it's got a few things until my body temperature cools and I feel ready for bed and then I go back again. Now there was a question as well about the opposite, about being cold in the middle of the night and waking up. Would that yeah. same advice apply for that? Yeah, I mean, if you're cold when you wake, maybe you just need a blanket. <laughs> Sleep with I, it more is layers. About, yeah, it is about creating an ideal sleep uh, environment though. It, I mean, that, that speaks to having that environment of having what you need around you so that it doesn't become disruptive in the middle of the night to create the kind of optimal temperature if you find your temperature is shifting. Mm -hmm. Another one, and I, you may have addressed this in the first one, but I think it's an important one. Many people seem to struggle with this, but what if your mind is overthinking at night and yeah. uh, that, that's keeping you up? Any techniques to yeah, assist I would, with that? I would really recommend if, if you didn't watch the first webinar, um, which we'll resend out to all the participants, to watch that one because we talk a lot about the mind overthinking at night. Most people think that the reason that they have insomnia is that they have a racing mind, but actually it's the first two causes, the circadian rhythm and the sleep drive. And when those two things get corrected, um, the, the, the racing mind habit settles. That said, we would still say you, you would wanna get up and write things down and not be thinking in bed as a general rule, that bed is for sleeping, but not for thinking. Um, any comment about weighted blankets? These we're hearing more about these days. And yeah, um, they're super expensive. They're really mm -hmm. expensive. Um, so the purpose of a weighted blanket is to help calm the nervous system. Um, could they be beneficial? They could if you prefer it and you feel like you like that cozy, snug feeling. However, I would still say that if you haven't corrected the body clock, the sleep driver, and being in bed awake, then a weighted blanket isn't going to help you. That's sort of, it, it becomes sort of the icing on the cake. If you've corrected all the other things and you prefer a weighted blanket, go ahead and, and try one. Um, but I wouldn't use it thinking it was going to correct the, the kind of major causes of insomnia. Okay. I love your comments again, expanding on hitting the snooze button. Can you expand on why that's uh, not a recommended practice? Hitting the snooze, oh, how I love it. But if you are a person with chronic insomnia, the reason that it causes problems is because sleep drive, um, our deep sleep for the following night begins when our feet hit the floor. So in our May webinar, I did a demonstration with a balloon where I inflated the balloon as we did things throughout the day. And so if we don't get our feet on the floor and we hit the snooze, we are delaying 
the amount of adenosine our body is producing, maybe for a half hour or an hour or an hour and a half. And so there is less sleep drive for the following night. So you can expect that you will have less deep sleep on the following night. So you kind of have to say, do I want to hit the snooze or do I want to have a good sleep? The other thing is the quality of sleep that happens at that time of the morning is usually very poor. Um, our deep sleep happens in the first half of the night. So if you do fall back asleep, it usually isn't enough to wake up feeling super well rested. So again, this is like advice for people that are struggling with common uh, with um, chronic insomnia. But I mean, lots of people can get away with hitting the snooze a couple of times, but often people with chronic insomnia cannot. Yeah. Any comments, uh, Caroline, just about meditating, whether it's at night to help you fall asleep or even in the morning to sort of set your day. Um, mm. If people use the bed as a place for meditating before sleep or in the morning, mm. would you recommend that practice or move to a different space? Or how would you build that in if meditation is something that people find mm. helpful? Meditation is, a, is an excellent strategy for managing um, racing thoughts and anxiety and stress. It works very well because it teaches us to sit and observe our thoughts instead of being dragged into them. However, when we're talking about insomnia, we don't want to be doing things that imply we have to exert effort to sleep because you don't have to exert effort to sleep. It will come naturally. So meditation is awesome, but I would not recommend doing it sort of in bed right before sleep because the purpose of meditation is awareness. It's being awake. It's not falling asleep. So definitely continue with a meditation practice. It could be part of an evening wind down routine. That, that starts an hour before bed when you do 10 minutes of meditation. It could be in the morning, but meditation, you know, doesn't need to happen in bed right before you fall asleep. Yeah. And there's a, a question just about how do you handle when partners have different sleep needs? Mm -hmm. So for example, uh, we've got a question here about a husband wife where one person's natural sleep seems to be more on the shorter side, six hours, a partner may need eight. How do you manage how do you manage that? Yeah, I think that is a very common problem that often there's one partner that's a morning person and one that's a night person and one that needs six hours and one that needs eight hours. And so it's really important to try and negotiate and protect, negotiate with our partners and protect our sleep. So using things like eye masks when one person's going to stay up later, um, adjusting, um, you know, sometimes even people will use a second bedroom. Um, but being, being sort of conscientious about what our partner's needs are for sleep and then finding a negotiated sleep routine that works in your house is really important because each person is a little bit unique. Mm -hmm. Sounds like communication over, over yes. sleep issues is important as well, getting That's an understanding right. of each other's needs. Definitely. Um, excellent. Well, Carolyn, as always, you've just been amazing in terms of the amount of knowledge you've had to share. I would really encourage everybody here, if they're interested in this topic of sleep, to uh, take advantage of that first webinar that Caroline did as well, because there were a lot of basics and foundational things about sleep. And I thought your balloon analogy of how we, how we build up that sleep drive is, was really excellent to see. So I would really encourage everybody to take advantage of that. So that wraps up our webinar for today. I would really like to thank you again, Caroline, for sharing uh, you. your tremendous knowledge and expertise and just practical advice um, with us today. It's really, really helpful and I'm sure many Thanks will uh, have some great tips. I also wanna just put out a reminder to everybody here today that although we're still in this, uh, we are still in this pandemic and we're all getting a little bit of COVID fatigue and COVID complacency as this goes on, but I want to remind everybody that the virus is still present in our community and in our country, and it hasn't gone away. So our public health advisories remain, remain in effect. Continue that social distancing. If you can't maintain that social distance in a public place, wear a mask. Important to look at hand hygiene, staying home when possible, and just really um, not going out if you're ill or have symptoms. The actions each one of us take remain important and that will make a difference in helping prevent a second wave. I also wanna remind everybody, we have our hashtag Wello community and love you to continue sharing um, any of your uh, pictures or thoughts. We just wanna keep building that positive community. So I hope everybody has a wonderful Canada Day tomorrow. Stay healthy and safe and we'll see you again soon. Bye.